We are in uh, Genesis chapter 39. Last week we saw how Joseph, uh, this one greatly beloved by his father, was sent by his father to check on his brother's work and to bring him information. And the brothers see him coming. They persecute him, throw him into a pit, end up selling him to the Ishmaelites who are going down to Egypt to trade him. You know, and he's sold into Egypt. What a picture of, you know, Christ is buried in this life of Joseph. Almost every step you can find these illustrations of, of who Christ is and what Christ was all about. You know, we're to be about the Father's purposes, you know. He's told us to go into the world among the brothers and and check on them and tell them about the Father and His love. And, you know, we have the Father's love. We have His dreams placed upon our hearts, these hopes, these these thoughts, you know. Genesis 37, 4, it says, But when His brothers saw them, saw that their Father loved Him more than everybody else you know they hated Joseph and that's the reason Christ went to the cross is you know he didn't go there because he was wrong he went there because people couldn't stand the fact that he was so loving so kind so gentle you know uh, this world hates us for that too you know uh, says in, in uh, 39.1 now Joseph had been taken and I read that first line, you know, and I'm thinking somebody needs to call Liam Neeson, you know, and, and send, s- what? You know, he's been taken. We need somebody with some special skills to, to go get him back. Anyway, and he is purchased by Potiphar. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. What a humiliating process. Taken down there, sold at the slave market, you know. And uh, here's Potiphar. Captain of the guard is literally, he's the chief executioner in the country for Pharaoh. Somebody needs their head taken off. Somebody needs punishment. He's the guy you go to. That's going to be very important in our story. Verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. Doesn't that just make you go, what? And he was successful. He was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Notice this. The Lord is with him. Think of this. All those hard feelings, all the jealousies, all the hatred, all the beatings, the selling him away, you know, the the stripping him naked and selling him at the slave market. God is with him through all of that, you know. I I think it's interesting. God is in all of that. Now, God didn't cause all of that, but God was behind all of that. You know, God uses all of that. Just the same way he uses hardship and trials and struggles and things in your life. Romans 8, 28, we know that just the good things in life work out for just the good things God has in mind for you, right? Is that what it says? We know that God uses all things. You know, those struggles, those trials, those sins, those, those <laughs> hardships, everything you're going through, those struggles with other people and business and all of that, God uses all of that to conform you into the image of his son. God's going to use the good, the bad, and the ugly. That must be why I have like three t-shirts that say that on it. I don't know. (laughs) To build, to prepare, to train us up. Never assume that just because some bad thing has happened in your family or with you or, or whatever's going on, some circumstance has arisen that God is now against you. God has, you know, he... I've blown it and it's over. And, you know, you go through all of that stuff. Never assume that. God uses those things in us down here to train us, 
to grow us, to build character in us. You know, James 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces. There's the whole point. We know what it's going to produce, you know, patience, and, you know, you let patience have its perfect work. But the fall, the struggle, the, the thing you're going through produces something. It grows a crop. That's what you're after. He goes on in James 1.12 and he says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Now we're going to find Joseph in this place where he has to endure temptation day after day after day. It's right there. Temptation's right there. It's right there. It's right there. Now I've never had to do that. You know, I, I dealt with temptation once and it's gone, right? Isn't that what we think, you know? It's not true. It's there every day. Blessed. He says, this is the blessed man. The blessed man is the one who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, we think when we're tempted, we've blown it. Oh, oh I've been tempted again. And oh. Sorry, the Lord was tempted and he was perfect. Temptation is not sin. Temptation's normal life down here. You know, Satan wants us to believe we've blown it when he's tempted us. But here's the thing. Here's a guy who's going to be tempted day after day after day. And guess what he does? The Lord is with him. He stands right there. He goes through it. It's Joe's hard work that's Joe's part, enduring. And it's God's blessing and it's God's holding. That's God's part. Do you see how they both work together here for Joe? It's just like, do you remember when um, Jacob was at Laban's house? And Laban was blessed because Jacob was there and all his flocks produced and everything was going really good. It's going to be the same here with Joseph in Potiphar's house. It says, And his, his master saw that the Lord was with him. Now notice this, that the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R. What does Potiphar know about the Lord? You know what he knows about the Lord? Joseph belongs to the Lord. And he sees it in Joseph's life. And he walks it out, and every time he looks up at Joseph, he sees, you know, the Lord. It's like when, when we tell Christians, you may be the only Bible your neighbor ever reads. You know, you may be the only one. Are they seeing him in you? Are they seeing it? You know? <sighs> Joe is honest. He is faithful. He's a man of character. He's a man of conduct. And God is blessing him because of that. And Potiphar's gaining from that, learning from that. You know, Jesus would say, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is Joseph right here. Joseph, through his hard work, through his character, through what he's doing at Potiphar's house, Potiphar knows God. <laughs> Verse 4, So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had was put under his authority. How many of us, if we were in Joseph's position, would still be whining? They took me away. They sold me away. I, I need to sneak away. I, I need to steal away some night and run back to home, you know, to get back. Joseph doesn't go back there. Joseph does the best where he is because he knows God is with him where he is. It's an interesting thing for me. We find Joseph in this new life, diving into the new, new life, not looking back Oh, 
the garlic and the leeks of Egypt. Oh, he, he doesn't do that. He plows ahead in this new field. His attitude is amazing, you know. His obedience is immediate. His work ethic is second to none. So there's a lot we can learn from Joseph here, right? Potiphar makes him the overseer. He puts him in control of everything in his house. Everything under his control, he gives to Joseph, except the meal that he's having this day. You know, I'm still choosing what I eat, but this guy's in charge of everything. He gives him access to his 401k. You run that for me, Joe. You run my business for me. You run my household. You take care of my chariots. Even that nice shiny one I just bought, you know. All the other servants are under Joe. Verse 5, so it was from that time that he made him overseer of his house that all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Why is Potiphar being blessed? Because Joseph is there, you know. Think about Colossians 3.22, you know, bond servants. Obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it all heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. Joseph is working for the Lord here, not for Potiphar. And the side effect of that is there's blessing happening. So verse 6. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Potiphar stopped worrying about everything in his household. That guy's running, he runs it better than I do. So he, he places, he, he trusts everything he has in Joseph's hands. Now here's a picture for you. God says, we're to cast all our cares upon him for he cares for us. And he does better with our stuff than we do with our stuff. Yet how many of us trust him with everything that we have, right? Just lay it out there and walk away from it. And then it adds this little point. And Joseph was young and trim and handsome dude, you know. <laughs> It's interesting. He's the, he's the complete package. He's a hard worker. He's, he's diligent. He's got it all. And verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said to him, lie with me. Casting longing eyes. Now I've I've been in the world a couple of times and, and I've been walking places with guys sometimes and there, there happens to be some, you know, sweet, beautiful young thing walking by. And I, I've, I understand what casting longing eyes looks like because all of my buddies do that. I don't. All of my buddies do, you know. And, you know, it's like they have those googly eyes on the, on the springs, you know, and they're weird. <laughs> You know, the eyes are the window to the soul. <laughs> what are your eyes turning to? What's, what's it telling about your soul? You know? And here's Joseph. He's 18, 20 years old. Think about that. He's 18, 20 year old male. This is the most dangerous creature on earth, right? Hormones are raging. There's some stuff going on. And this kid, he doesn't understand. He is away from home. Nobody knows him here. I don't, I don't have a character to withstand. I don't have to stand up to this, you know, illusion of who I am. I can be whatever I want to be. Here's the thing. Fornication, adultery, turns a a clear stream into a cesspool. And it transforms free people into slaves, slaves of sin, slaves of lust and desire. It turns something that started out really sweet into poison, 
bitterness, acid. And of course, it all starts with the heart. Now here you have this great comparison between Joseph's heart and Potiphar's wife's heart. Her heart, she lusts for him, you know? Sometimes when God brings spiritual blessings into a man's life, there also comes physical temptations. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting the way that works. We're in a battle in this world. I don't know if you realize that. You know, the Lord calls us his army. He calls you soldiers, you know. And it's only through the Spirit and through prayer and through the Word of God that we can keep our footing correct in the right place. Notice verse 8. But he refused. How many 18-year-old kids do you know would have passed that test? And said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has into my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He refuses. Just imagine if America had the character of Joseph. Just imagine if you had the character of Joseph, right? Here's, here's, uh, here's Joe. He tries to reason with her. Look, this is the reason I'm not going to do this. It's not right. Your master has trusted me with everything except you. And you're his and I, you know, there's, there's a gap here. I can't cross that gap. I'm not going there. He's committed everything. He owns me. He, he gave everything to me except you. The only thing he hasn't turned over to me is you. You belong to him completely, not to me. You're his wife. That's sacred ground. I'm not walking there. <laughs> this would be great wickedness. Oh, how we don't believe that today. Fooling around, making love. Hooking up, shacking up, you know, whatever you want to call it today is great wickedness to God. It's sin against God. All through the Bible, this attitude is called the fear of the Lord. We see Joseph standing here all by himself in a foreign land. Nobody knows him. He's 18, 20 years old. He's got desires. He's got needs. And here's this beautiful woman, I'm guessing, right? Potiphar, he's a man. He, he's high in the officials of the government. I don't think he has, you know, a bad-looking wife. I think she might be a trophy wife. Hey, big boy, come on in, you know. But Joseph, he's aware of one thing. And I wrote it down like this. It's the fear of the Lord. Here's what the fear of the Lord looks like. It's the ever awareness of the ever thereness of God. I'm always aware that God is always here. I'm always aware. <laughs> Jesus tells us, you know, and, and that idea is both equally convicting. Oh, Jesus is here. You know, he's watching everything I do. And comforting. Oh, Jesus is here. Thank you, Lord. You know. Jesus tells us, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You know, he tells us all of these words. So verse 10. So it was. As she spoke to Joseph day by day. Lord, why can't I just pray and this thing just disappears? You know? I've asked you to just take this, this temptation away. Just take it away and be done with it. That he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Once his reasoning doesn't work. Imagine that. Reason doesn't work with an unbeliever. Just picture it. 
It's this idea of she has allowed something into her heart that doesn't belong in her heart. And because it's come into her heart, now it's become a desire. And a desire will outgun your brain, your mind. Oh, I can, I, I'll never give in to that. I've got, I've, I can think my way clearly here. Not once it becomes a desire. The Bible's very clear. You allow something into your heart and it will own you. <laughs> I don't know if it's the boss and some secretary, married man and a girl at the bar. I don't know if it's an unhappy wife and the guy next door. I don't know. But if you allow that to get into your heart, it becomes a desire and it will overrule your brain. <laughs> Keep your heart with all diligence. The Word of God says. It's literally guard your heart with all. It's you got to set a guard around your heart to keep all of those things out of there, right? And to keep in there the things that actually belong in there. For out of it issues, or out of it springs all the issues of life. If there's something in your heart that you've allowed in there that doesn't belong in there, then you need to deal with it. And how do you deal with it? Well, you need to pray. You need to repent. You need to confess. You need to say, Lord, here's this heart. And it used to not be like this, but now it's like this. And Lord, would you clear this stuff out? Get this stuff out. And then you have to set a guard. You have to. Not God. You have to. And only allow in there what belongs in there. Verse 25, or... or uh, Proverbs 25, 28 says this, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. If your heart is like a city with no walls, anything can come in and go out of there. What a dangerous place, dangerous place. So day after day after day, as Joe goes to work, temptation is there every day. <laughs> it's become uh, a nightmare to go to work. You know, and it's, it's no, you know, she is, she is hunting him. She's hunting him. It's no wonder, you know, uh, Egyptian women were famous for immorality. They're the first culture with eye makeup. They're the first culture with hairdos. They're the first culture with perfume. I mean, just imagine. Imagine what could happen, you know? And here's this, I think, beautiful woman coming on to Joseph every day of his life. Have you ever heard that voice every day? Just one look. Just one sip. Just one, you know, whatever your little pole is in life. It's okay. It's okay to go window shopping as long as you're not buying, you know? Sorry, it's not okay, you know? It's Here's an 18-year-old, 19, 20-year-old kid. We have no excuses. If he can do it, we must be able to walk on that side too, right? We need to do what Joe does. He stays away from his addiction. He stays away from the temptation. You know, this is not a mystery. How do you do this? It's pretty black and white, you know? You're addicted to Snickers bar. Don't walk down that aisle. Maybe not even drive to that store. Verse 11. But it happened about that time when Joseph went into the house to do his work that none of the men were in the house None of the men of the house were inside. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. One day Joe comes to work and all the other servants are gone. And this seems like a setup to me. Right? This is a planned day. Joe has been avoiding her, 
keeping distance, you know, not being alone in the same room, doing all of this stuff. He's been doing everything. So all these smart moves. He doesn't sit down and counsel with her. Let's have tea. Let's sit down and let's talk about your issues. He, he doesn't do that. He doesn't try to witness to her. He doesn't do that. What's he do? Stays away. Is distance, you know. This, this is a good thing, you know. And she grabs him one day. Come on, boy, you know. And he, you know, he sneaks out. of. He slips out of his jacket, reaches down, ties up his felony flyers, you know, make sure they're laced on. Boom, he's out of there. There are times when that's cowardice to run. There are times when that's absolutely the right thing to do. <laughs> Sometimes that's our last hope. I just got to get out of dodge, you know. So Joe's way of escape, run. Remove yourself from the temptation, whatever the cost. This is going to cost him. Whatever the cost, get out. Here's the thing. Do you have a plan? <laughs> See, as a sinner, you know, when I became a Christian, I had a few issues, lingering issues. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has ever had them. But at times, you know, you'd walk into a room, you'd get into a situation, and here's this issue, and it's confronting you. Do you have a plan about your issues? You know, when this happens, I must do this. You don't go to war without making a plan. You are in a war, and you better have a plan. Verse 13, and so it was when she saw that he left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she feels jilted. He's my slave. I own him as much as my husband does. Oh, I'm going to make an example out of him. Can you hear it? That she called the men of the house and spoke to them saying, he has brought, notice how she talks about Potiphar, her husband. Notice her attitude about her husband here. He has brought in a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice, and it happened when I cried out. I lifted up my voice that he left his garment with me, and he fled, and he went outside. That's why he's hiding behind that bush outside, just in his underwear, because I got his robe right here, and you know. She calls all the other men in, tells them what this guy has done. Now, all the other men are probably Egyptians, and the Egyptians didn't like the, the Hebrews, the Haberai, you know, these these uh, uh, shepherds. And so they're jealous of his position anyway. He, he's been put in charge of all of us. And, you know, this gives him another reason not to like him. So she kept his garment with her until the master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened, as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and he fled outside. And so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did this in this manner, that his anger was aroused. And I wonder about this. Because it doesn't say he's ticked at Joseph. It says he's ticked. At who? At who? Do you think he knows his wife? Hmm. You know, in Egypt, an attempted rape like this of a citizen, they would be killed. An attempted rape like this of a slave, just off with his head, he's done. But notice what this guy does. Verse 20, Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Huh? He's the chief executioner. He's the guy in charge of taking care of business in Egypt. He doesn't kill Joseph. What's going on there? Now, I realize God's involved here. Not trying to degrade that. I'm just telling you, I think Potiphar knows there's something else cooking here. 
And I think he's ticked because now he has to pull Joseph out of his household that was being blessed. Everything was being blessed and now I can't use him at the house. So where am I going to use him? I'm going to use him at work. Oh, I will move him into my workspace and I will use him there and maybe he will bless me there. And guess what's going to happen? This is where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. What? Again? Still? And showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. So Joe, Joe ends up in this prison, and he ends up being blessed and a servant in the prison. You know, great lessons for us. Even in prison, God can use you. God uses this as a training program to flesh out some things he needs to flesh out in Joseph. I don't think this is a fun training program. I, I don't think it's encouraging and easy. And, you know, he gets up every morning, Woohoo! I'm in prison. What do I get to do for the Lord today? You know, I, 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 don't, I don't see that. I think it's a really tough program. But whatever Joe does, God blesses. I think you should underline that line. Whatever Joe does, God blesses. Hmm. Now, during all of this time, we think, man, what a wasted life. Joseph is going to be 11 to 13 years in prison. 11 to 13 years. <laughs> it's probably the deepest, hardest trial of his life. And he's working, he's doing his best, but in the back of his mind, is he thinking, man, this is unfair. This is unjust. I've done none of this stuff. I'm, I'm innocent. I shouldn't be in this prison. I, you know, why is this going on, God? I, I got a lot of questions, you know. All of this is a process. His father had had dreams, and it changed his father's life. He told Joseph about those. Then Joseph has a couple of dreams, you know. And he uses this time to figure out what those dreams mean, I believe. He's going to need to know, because when he gets let out of prison, he's going to need to know how to interpret a dream. And he's going to say, hey, is an interpretation of God? Well, tell me, and I'll run it through God, and we'll figure this out. So verse four, or chapter 40, And it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. It just so happens that two uh, other high officials of Pharaoh get thrown in the clink. Now, the butler is, is really the cupbearer. He's the food taster. Everything that that the king is going to eat, he eats. He tastes first. It goes through him. This guy's life is on the line for the king. And they are usually fast friends. They are usually close confidants because here's a guy willing to die for me. So I can trust him. And the chief baker, the guy in charge of making all the meals, he comes in too. So, so what's going on here? I don't know if it was just bad food, bad service one day. You know, I don't know if there's some kind of conspiracy. I don't know what's going on. You know, they probably just served him a Caesar salad. Right? <laughs> I'm waiting for everybody to get it. I might have to wait a while. So anyway... And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker, and he put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard. Notice those words. Whose house? The captain of the guard? You remember who that was? 39, verse 1. The captain of the guard bought him. This is Pharaoh's prison. Or this is Potiphar's prison. 
the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in his custody for a while. <sighs> and then the butler and the baker, the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night. Each man's dream was its own interpretation. And Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them and saw them, and they were sad. And he said to Pharaoh's officers, who were in his custody of the Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? Isn't that a stupid question? Well, let's see. We used to serve the king in the palace. We had everything. We had access to everything. And now we're in prison. Why are you so sad? Why are you so bummed out today? <laughs> but apparently, there is something about their countenance that is really off this morning. And Joseph is curious. In verse 8, And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me. We both had a dream. We can't figure it out. We're sure there's some kind of thing going on. We're sure these are important dreams. They just have that sense. They have that feeling. Hey, well, don't these interpretation things belong to God? And I happen to know God. Maybe you should tell me. Let's see if we can figure it out. I think it's interesting. I think he's learned this while being in prison. He's learned to look at dreams. He's, he's learned this. He's been checking in with God through these times. Verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and he said, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me. In the vine were three branches, and it was, and it, it was as though it budded, it blossomed, shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So the butler says, man, I saw this vine and it had three branches. And it, in, like instantaneously, it buds out, it blossoms, produces fruit. Suddenly the fruit is in my hand. Pharaoh's cup is in my hand. I just press it in there and hand it back to Pharaoh. It's like, man, this is amazing, right? And here's the interpretation. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were with the butler. Three branches, three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. It's interesting. In the King James, it's the same words used for both. He will lift up your head. But one is lift off your head and one is lift up your head. You want your head lifted up. You don't want it lifted off. That, that may be a, a bad thing. But anyway, he's going to restore you to your place. He's going to put his cup back in your hand. And it's going to be just like it used to be, right? Right back to where it is. That is a great news, right? This is the kind of interpretation we all want. Woohoo! I'm back. I'm going to be back in the black. You know, everything's good. But these dreams are important because without these dreams, he will never get before Pharaoh. So these dreams are vital. These set the stage to bring in Israel, to bring Israel into Egypt, to save them through that big famine, to bring in the Messiah, for Christ to die on the cross. All that hinges on this dream, it really does. But he says in verse 14, but remember me. Here's Joseph, his own little sales ploy. Hey, you know, when you get out, you may want to mention me, you know. When it's well with you, and please show kindness to me, make mention of me to Pharaoh. That gets my attention. Why would Joseph think he needs to be mentioned to Pharaoh? Because I believe that he's understood his two dreams. That his brothers are going to, you know, bow down to him. That the sun, the moon, and the stars are going to bow down to him. And that is in Pharaoh's presence. I, I believe he understands that now. He sees that now. He says, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, 
I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. He doesn't say, my stupid brothers, you know. He doesn't go there. And I have also done nothing here that, I, that should put me into prison. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he goes, okay, I need one of those. He says, well, I also had a dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. Verse 17, the baker says, well, man, I'm all excited now. Here's, here's my dream. I was out there, and I had these three baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, all kinds of baked goods, you know? fritters and jelly rolls and you know all kinds of stuff in there and the birds were in there just eating away at them <laughs> tell me what this means you know and the interpretation the baskets well, Joseph answered and said this is the interpretation of it the three baskets are three days within three days Pharaoh will lift off your head uh -huh. stop right there and you will be hanged on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. <laughs> three baskets or three days. Within three days, Pharaoh's going to send you to the executioner, and then they're going to impale your body and stick you in the ground for everybody to see. And the birds are going to sit around and eat at you. Now, I just want to take a minute to look at these dreams and give you another perspective. Because many prophecies in the Old Testament are double prophecies. They have a near and a far picture. I'm not saying this is accurate. I'm just saying this is something I see in there. I see a picture of the bread and of the cup. You see communion here? Three elements or the, th the three days, the, the threes are the resurrection. So the butler, the cupbearer, the food taster, he has a vine. And that vine sprouts, it flowers, it, it grows fruit. It's a fruitful vine. Who's our fruitful vine? You know, doesn't Jesus say in John, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. For unless a, a branch abides in the vine, it cannot do anything. It's, it's worthless. And of course, this is a picture of someone that abides in Christ, of someone who, you know, is born again, has that new life, has that abiding. The fruit of the vine, of course, the cup in communion. The cup represents the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, it was shed. His life was laid down to wash us from our sins and to introduce us into and make us part of the new covenant, the New Testament, and where we receive life. And what happened to the, the butler? He received life, right? But then you look at the baker. The baker, the guy with the bread, in communion, the, the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken, that, that went to the grave, that died. But the butler, the illustration is, he's got all of this stuff in his head. He, he understands the picture of Christ. He understands that, that that Christ is important. He's got him up there in his head, but the birds are picking away at that. And birds in, in stories in the Bible are almost always evil. Here is evil picking away, plucking away at the bread of life. So he doesn't have a complete, clear, accurate picture. He only understands the physical of Jesus, not the supernatural, not the spiritual. So the butler only partakes of a physical view of Jesus, and that physical dies. That physical is death. That physical goes to the grave. If we don't partake of the whole Jesus, body, soul, and spirit, if we don't partake of everything that he came to do, 
we're going to be like the baker and just left with the old rotting flesh, being picked at, eaten away at, being consumed by evil and wickedness. And the end of that is death, not life. Well, we want them both. You know, the cupbearer, the, the original guy, he served everything. He tasted everything that went to his Lord. You know, God tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, you know, there's some pictures in here. So, you know, Jesus would say, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which speak of me. And I think these dreams speak of Christ in, a, in an amazing way. So verse 20. Uh, i got to find myself. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, everybody got their little birthday hats on and stuff that he made a feast for all of his servants he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants so he invites them both back in look this is the palace we're having a big party this is great and he restored the chief butler to his butlership again but he and he placed the cup of Pharaoh in his hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Three days later, a huge feast, a birthday party. He restores the chief butler, places the cup back in his hand. You're my best bud again. Here we go. But he hangs the chief baker. It seems he removes his head, sticks him on a pole, and sits him out there in the party. You know, whoo this is fun. Yet the butler forgot to mention Joseph. <laughs> I think this is divine amnesia, right? Because it's all about God's timing. He can't come out of this prison. He can't come until Pharaoh has his dream. That's when he's going to be needed. That's when he's being prepared for. This is the timing. So you're going to stay in prison. How long is it going to be? At least another two years. Huh. Another two years? Forgotten, you know. In Psalm 105, 17, it says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. They humbled him in fetters, in, in chains, in stocks. They laid him in irons. In the Hebrew, they laid his soul in irons. He, God is refining Joseph in the furnace of, of the prison. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And the word tested him is to refine, it's to fuse metal together, it's to purge the word of the Lord does that when we're in awkward, hard places. So here we are tonight because the cupbearer forgot to mention Joseph to Pharaoh. We have to realize that God is sovereign. God is holding on to this young man. God is blessing this young man. God is, is with this young man wherever he is. Because God blesses the man who endures temptation. You know, you think about Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is upon the law of the Lord, and upon his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of waters who, who brings forth his fruit in its season and also whose leaf shall not wither. But the ungodly are not so, you know. Here's this great difference. Anyone in here ever fail? Ever just blow it, you know? Then get it straightened out. Get it straightened out. Find somebody you trust in the body of Christ and go talk to them. Just don't go talk to some people in the body of Christ because you know how they are, right? Find somebody trustworthy, somebody, you know, that won't blab and share. 
man, I'm struggling with this. I need prayer about that. I'm going through this and I don't know what to do. And you, you know, you get into those places. Stop being more concerned about your reputation than you are about your character. That's hard, right? Well, I don't want people to think I'm a jerk. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'd rather have the right character. You know, if you knew my reputation, you'd understand that. I've already got the reputation. I'm trying to, trying to get a little character now, you know. Use the Christian bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is righteous. He is just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, how we need that, right? Read Revelation 2, 4 and 5. Y you know it, you know. I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. I want you to remember from where you have fallen. The first R, remember. Remember who you used to be and now, now you're down here in this pit. Remember who you used to be. Repent. Repent means to change your mind, to turn around, start going the other way. And then repeat. Do the first things. Do what you used to do. You used to come to church all the time. You used to read your Bible. You used to pray. You used to do this. You used to do that. How come you're not doing that? Get back into that. Start doing that again. So it's remember, repent, repeat. You know how I know those by <clears throat> memory, right? Because I've had to remember, repent, and repeat many, many times. Christ loves you. It's his pleasure to bring you into the kingdom. He's excited about that. He's not, oh man, it's him again. It's her again. Here they come. Same story. It, that is not him. He wants you to bring your sin into the light. That's where he deals with sin. When you finally bring it into the light, say, Lord, I've been, here it is, you know, this is it. Let yourself out of prison. Let yourself out of prison. Because for the most part, it's you that have you, yourself bound up, you know. Jesus, didn't he say, whom the Son sets free will be free indeed? He says that. Come, be freed this morning, right now, you know. God might be having you in a little trial situation, put a little iron into your soul, you know. Conforming you to the image of Christ. And that confirmation, that is just crazy. How is Mark ever going to get to be anything like Jesus? There's got to be some, there's going to be some conforming things happen. And what you understand is whatever brings light to a situation in your life is the Word of God, is light. Whatever brings acknowledgement, whatever brings this to the surface, that's God working in you. And we must just go, thank you, Jesus, for caring enough not to let me get away with this, but to hold me accountable, straighten me up, and get me back to where I belong. That's, that's where we need to be. Father, I just, uh, I love your word. Lord, in, in so many places, it's so crystal clear. You so loved us, you sent Jesus. He was the absolute best, top, amazing He's the only one. He's the perfect one. And you sent him. How will you not also supply everything else that we need to come to you, to be forgiven, to be washed, to be taken care of? So God, I just pray for hearts this morning. God, would you do that work in individual lives around here? Lord, allow us to bear our soul before you. Lord, hear our pleas. Lord, many of us have been taken captive by the evil one, by some thing. 
some element. And God, we, we beg, Lord, for you to break that chain, to set us free, to wash us clean. Lord, I pray for the others, Lord, that we would have hearts of forgiveness, of love and care and concern. Lord, that you'd remove the bitterness and the hatred and the hard hearts and the unlove. And Lord, replace it with you, the one who is so willing and so freely forgives and loves. Lord, give us that love that is long-suffering, that isn't self-seeking, the one that just mimics, mocks you, or, or uh, speaks like you speak, Lord, where you so love that you give everything that you have for us. Lord, come and do those works in us this morning, this week. Lord, wash and cleanse. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.